Sutra 2, Lingacha. And this is so on account of the indicatory mark. The indicatory sign also conveys the idea of repetition. Thus it is that after starting with the meditation on the Udgita, the meditation on the Udgita as the sun is decried as productive of a single sun. Then in the sentence, you meditate repeatedly on the Udgita separately as the sun and its rays. Chandogya 1511. The text prescribes by the term Payavartaya, meditate repeatedly, the meditation on the multiplicity of the rays for getting many suns. Thereby, the text indicates that the repetition of the mental act is assumed as an established fact. Hence, from a similarity of this, it follows that repetition should be the rule in all cases of mental acts. The opponent says here, Granted that the mental acts that are productive of results may well be repeated when some excellence can be produced in them through the repetition. But what purpose can be served by the repetition where a single mental act about the Supreme Brahman calls up the Supreme Brahman which is eternally pure, intelligent, and free by nature, and which is identical with one's own self? Objection. Repetition has to be undertaken since the realization of the identity of Brahman and the self does not reasonably result from a single hearing. Opponent, no, since that will not logically follow even after repetition. If the hearing of such texts as That Thou Art, Chandogya 6, 8, 7, once only does not generate the realization of the identity of Brahman and the Self, then how can it be expected that even a repetition of that will produce it? Again, it may be argued that a mere sentence cannot produce the direct perception of anything, and hence that sentence, helped by reasoning, will produce the realization of the identity of Brahman and the Self. But even so, this reasoning also may well lead to a perception of its object after a single application. Namaste. So what is the indicatory sign? The lingat. Huh? It is that in the Shastras, so many things, so many meditations are given as something that must be practiced on a regular daily basis. And for example, he brings up the idea of the Udgita. The Udgita is the chanting of the Samaveda. The Sama, by the way, these chants are some of the most beautiful chants uh, in Vedic culture. And they are chanted by the Udgatri priest at Vedic sacrifices. And the whole idea is that this is the mark of something that must be practiced regularly. This is a mark means a symptom of a quality. So the symptom of the quality that ongoing practice is necessary are the instructions that these meditations must be repeated. And that is found all throughout the Vedas. So what is this opponent trying to do, actually? What are they trying to prove, you know? Like we say back in New York, hey, what are you trying to prove, mister? Right? That... Simply by hearing one time, tattvamasi, you can realize Brahma. That knowing that 
is realization of Brahman. Really, this is what he's saying. You don't need to do any practices. No further study is necessary. And certainly no meditation and definitely not any austerity. <laughs> See, this is exactly Neo-Advaita philosophy. That, yeah, man, I know Brahman. Yeah, cool, you know. Yeah, bro, pass the joint. Yeah, no. <laughs> you don't know. The problem began in the late 19th century when the Vedic literatures began to translate into English. And the word jnana was mistranslated knowledge. Now, yeah, it's knowledge in the broadest sense of realized experience. Jnana is that experience that proves the point of the existence of Brahman, and that Brahman is everything, and that one should realize Brahman. But it was mistranslated because the English word knowledge is so broad, it could mean anything, from a superficial acquaintance to a deep realization. The word vidya in Sanskrit is what means academic knowledge, verbal knowledge, logical knowledge. But jnana means realized knowledge, means that knowledge which results from a change in consciousness, a change in being. So really what the opponent is trying to do here is to say that I don't need to work on myself. I don't need to do any sadhana. Simple verbal knowledge is enough. Objection. It may also be argued that reasoning and the text can only produce a knowledge of the general features of the object, but not so of its special features. From such a declaration as, I have a pain in the heart, and from such symptoms as the contortion of the body, another person can understand in a general way that there is a pain, but he cannot have a full experience of the pain like the suffering man. Since an intimate knowledge of this nature leads to the removal of ignorance, the repetition is needed for that purpose. Opponent. This cannot be so since the intimate knowledge cannot possibly arise even if that much is done repeatedly. For a special aspect that cannot be known from the scripture and reasoning at the first instance cannot be known even after resorting to them a hundred times. So whether it be the intimate knowledge or the general knowledge that is produced by scripture and reasoning, it must be so at the very first application, so that repetition has no place. And there can be no such rule that nobody can have any intimate knowledge at the very first instant, since people who would know have divergent intelligence. Again, with regard to a thing of this world, possessing common and peculiar features, there may be scope for repetition, inasmuch as a man may understand only one feature at one attempt and others at subsequent attempts, as, for instance, in reading a long chapter. But it is not reasonable that there should be any need of repetition for comprehending Brahman, which is absolute consciousness, without common and peculiar features. To this we Vedantins say, repetition will be unnecessary for one who can realize the self as Brahman after hearing that thou art once only. But for one who cannot do so, repetition is a necessity. Thus it is noticed in the Chandogya Upanishad that Udalika teaches his son that thou art, O Shveta Ketu, Chandogya 6, 8, 7, and then being requested by his son again and again, O revered sir, explain to me again, Ibid, he removes the respective causes of his Shveta Ketu's misconceptions and teaches that very fact that thou art repeatedly. That very process is referred to by citing the text, 
It is to be heard of, reflected on, and meditated upon. Brihad Aranyakopanishad 4, 5, 6. So it's just like if we see someone suffering from some physical ailment. We can tell from their physical symptoms that they're suffering, but we cannot feel their suffering. So similarly, by reading the scriptures, by hearing lectures and so on, we can get a general vague idea of what self-realization is. But we can't experience it directly for ourselves unless we do all the practices, unless we do extensive sadhana. Yeah, sure, there may be someone so intelligent, so well-prepared, that simply hearing tatramasi leads them to immediately realize Brahma. There's the story of Sariputta in the Buddha's pastimes. Sariputta was a very intelligent Brahmana. He and his friend had been looking for a truth for a long, long time, going to many different teachers, but they weren't satisfied. And one day they came across one of the disciples of the Buddha and asked him, well, what does your master teach? And he says, one verse of those things which are created, both the beginning and the end. One little verse. But by the time Sariputta heard the first half of that verse, of all things that are created, boom, he got first path realization. So this was someone who was adequately prepared, who is intelligent, who is developed, who has been searching for a long time and just needs a tiny little push to get it. But how many people are actually like that? Well, I mean, really. Those are the exception rather than the rule. The rule is we need to hear it many, many times. <laughs> and even then, we still don't get it. <laughs> That's because simple hearing is not enough. One has to remove the upadis covering our native knowledge of Brahman, huh? our native being as Brahman. And that can only be accomplished through practice, repetitive practice, and austerity. What is austerity? It means voluntary suffering. That's the way Gurdjieff defined it. I think that's a really good definition. We live in a world driven by karma. Karma means the reactions to past activities. We may not even remember them because they're in a previous life, but they have an effect on our everyday experience here. This is why Jyotish is such a good thing to study, because it shows how even at the moment of birth, one is already affected by the karmas from the previous life. So, what to speak of the further actions that we perform in this life? Both good and bad. And one who accrues sufficient karma for self-realization, that means karma in the sattva guna, the mode of goodness, they get in their birth chart, moksha karaka, which means an indicator that in this life they will have the opportunity the possibility to reach moksha. Now, whether they do or not is up to them. How well they take advantage of that opportunity. So the point is that without further practice, without further development, and without practice of austerity, voluntarily giving up enjoyments and things like that, one cannot realize moksha, even if one has the moksha karaka, the indicator of karmic preconditions for the release. 
Therefore, one should perform sadhana regularly, daily. In fact, one should base one's whole life on the performance of sadhana, because only sadhana gives results that never decay. Only sadhana gives spiritual results, a change of consciousness that, once realized, remains with us forever. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Om. Om Namah Shivaya.